Well, everybody, welcome to um, our Slate and Stylist. It's all about the Braille session. Um, Jennifer will be presenting for us today, and Nick and I are co-hosting. Um, we would love for you to be able to raise your hand on the chat and ask questions as we go. So we'll kind of take pauses throughout the session. Um, this is being recorded and will be available on the NOPBC.org website, um, hopefully within the next couple of days. So um, if you want to go back and refer to it or share it with other people, you are welcome to. But um, Jennifer, why don't you tell, start off by tell us, telling us a little bit about yourself, and then you can jump in and talk to us about the Slate and Stylist. Sure. Um, well, my name is Jennifer Wenzel. I am the admissions coordinator for Blindness Learning and New Dimensions Incorporated, which is our training center in Minnesota. Um, I'm also, um, I've been blind since birth, and I am the mother of three sighted boys, um, and I have a blind husband. Um, we live in Bloomington, Minnesota, and um, yeah, so I love to cook, read, um, go to plays and concerts when they exist, <laughs> although now I've been doing them virtually. Um, so I learned Braille as a child. I learned when I was five. It was my, or four, I guess I started. Um, it was my only reading option. There was no um, question because I could not see at all to read print. I just have light perception. Um, but I didn't learn Slate and Stylus until I was nine. I loved to read and I loved to write and I loved Braille. Um, but I had a Perkins Brailler and I had to lug it all over when I wanted to write things. And that was okay, but I, I was kind of lazy and I didn't always like to do that. So sometimes I would dictate things to people or, you know, not really write them down. So when I was in fourth grade, I got a new um, teacher of blind students and she was fresh out of school and really enthusiastic about the slate and stylus. But she taught me with a board slate. So it was a kind of like a clipboard. I don't have one to show, unfortunately. I have some other things to show later, but it was like a clipboard where you clip the paper at the top and then it had grooves on the sides and you moved the slate down um, each time. You wrote four lines and then moved it down into these grooves um, with holes. The, the slate had little pegs that went into little holes on the sides of the board and you moved it down the paper. And I liked writing with a slate and stylus, okay, but I didn't really understand what she was so excited about because it wasn't much more portable than the braille writer. It was big and kind of clunky and I didn't really care. But luckily she told my mom to buy one for me to practice with. And my mom, who <laughs> loves a bargain, as do I, um, she was looking in the catalog. My mom loves a bargain, but she doesn't always check things out carefully when she's looking at the bargain. So she saw this cheaper option and she didn't really read about it. And she just thought, oh, well, this is a better deal. And she bought that. And it turned out to be a four line metal slate, kind of like this. This one's made of nickel. The one I had was just made of aluminum. But is that in good camera, camera view? Yeah. I'm not used to doing video presentations. <laughs> so um, thank you to Kyle, who's doing camera work for me today. Um, anyway, this, um, slate is four lines and it's just something you can hold in your hand you can put it in your purse you can um, carry it in a backpack and um, that's what really got me excited about using the slate luckily her mistake was something that got me really into it because it's portable it's something i can carry or could carry around and i could use it in all kinds of different ways um, when i was learning braille and I went to school, I went to school with sighted kids at public school in Watertown, Wisconsin. I was the first blind student to go to school in that school system. And everybody had all these pens and pencils and they could write wherever they wanted to. They could write on their hand and they could write, you know, on paper or anytime, anywhere. And that always made me kind of jealous. Now, I still couldn't write on my hand. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. But I could write anywhere and everywhere like they could. This was sort of my equivalent of a pencil. So I got real excited about it and started using the slate all over. Um, are there any, I guess I'll pause here for a second and see if there's any questions and then I'll go on. No, there's not any questions that I see right now. Not yet, okay. So um, there are a lot of different types of slates and um, the slate is essentially a hinged thing. Oh, you know, I should show it this way showing it backwards. So each rectangle on the slate is a braille cell. And um, on the back, you kind of feel like 
full cells. When you're writing with a slate, you're writing right to left so that your text comes out left to right when you read it. Um, a lot of kids or adults, when they're trying to learn the slate, get really confused because people talk about it being backwards. Um, I did my piece of paper. Oh, good. Um, and, and that can be confusing and frustrating. I talk about it to some people like mirror writing, but really, especially if you're teaching a young kid, I just say, you know, you're gonna be writing right to left and your, your stuff comes out on the other side of the paper, just like you want it. And um, talk about kind of a, I don't know, I, sometimes I'll talk about being code, like if you know, you're doing it on one side, it comes out on the other, and it gets to be kind of fun. So you put the paper in the hinges of the slate, and then you have your cells. And there's also, so there's different sizes of slates. So that's one. Then there's a note card slate, which actually you can write on either side. You can do interpoint braille with it. And I just learned today that's actually got a name. It's called a Janus slate. I didn't do that. So that's for like index cards. And then what do we do? Then there's even a case to carry slates in. I guess it's called a slate mate. One of my coworkers had one. And in there is a plastic slate, which is the cheapest option and most portable. And especially if kids are kind of hard on things, it's, it's got pros and cons. It breaks easily, but it's also cheap to replace. So I, I don't personally love them, but they're, they're there and they're definitely a good cheap option. And then there's also a one line labeling slate. Um, which you can use with Dymo tape, which I'll talk more about in a little while. There's also different types of styluses. Some people call this one the saddleback stylus. I think it looks like a dog bone, personally, but it's so kind of what I've always kind of called them. Um, there's also, I used to have a stylus in the shape of a pen. I don't own it anymore, but it actually had a stylus that screwed off and you could turn it over and it was a braille eraser. Um, so that's made. Um, that one had a little clip. Uh, oh, oh, it's under my braille display. There's also this round kind that has a little flat edge for so that it does not roll. These are I like these a lot. I also like they don't really make the one that I really love, which is a completely round one that's more like a knob without the flat side. But I have trouble finding those now. They're kind of fat and they're, they're my personal favorite. You want to experiment with different ones to see what works well. Um, I will tell you that in a pinch, when I have not had my stylus, I have used an actual pen. You can do it. It's not ideal, but it does work. I've also used an earring, <laughs> which again, I don't recommend, but it is, you need something sharp and small. <laughs> so sometimes you just are flexible and you use what you have. So I don't know. Can you show if I'm writing on the paper? Mm -hmm. So when you are learning the slate, you want the person to explore the little braille cells with their stylus. If you're moving your stylus down, you can feel little, I don't know how to say, grooves, grooves I guess, where your, where your stylus clicks into place. And those are the dots. So dot one is now on the right. That's where your A is. And B is in the middle and the right. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six. I don't personally care what order people go in. Some people are very hung up on, you know, you have to go uh, in a certain order, you know, right and then left. Whatever works, some people think different ways. Um, I guess for speed, I think I generally stick to the right side first and then move over to the left. But especially when someone's first learning, I wouldn't get too hung up on like the order they're going in or how they're doing it. I would just make it fun like any other braille thing that you're doing. Make it fun, make it a game. I think that young kids should be able to scribble with their slate, just like people scribble with a pen or a pencil. They should just be able to experiment and play with it and try to get things right, um, see what kind of letters they come up with and just play around with it. Feel good about pushing that stylus through the paper. Now there's all kinds of different paper you can use too. I have right now this uh, eight and a half by 11 actual braille paper, but you can slate, the beauty of the slate is you can slate on any paper. Um, you can use spiral notebook paper. You can use index cards. Um, 
you can use, so some index cards, you can buy them in like a spiral binding. And I've used those for a lot of things like appointments. Um, when I was a younger kid in middle school and high school, I did wrote down my assignments on those little note cards. APH now makes this handy little pocket notebook with cards. Um, it's got a lot of little rings and you can have the card inside here. And so you can actually take it out of the book, slate on it, and then put it back in here to keep track of it. Um, you can also slate on playing cards, on um, uh, birthday cards, Christmas cards, Valentine's Day cards. It's very versatile. You can use it on lots of different surfaces. The thing that will change is how long your braille lasts. If you use spiral notebook paper or just regular like printer paper, it's easy to punch through, but it won't hold up for a real, real long time. So it just depends what you're doing. If you're just scribbling, you know, you're at a doctor's waiting room or a dentist's waiting room or sitting in your car now that everything's virtual waiting rooms and your kid wants to scribble with a slate, just give them a hard surface to write on like a, a book or something that could, that with a hard cover or um, books, books work really well. Um, that's probably the firmest, a thering binder, something with like a firmer surface. Um, and then, you know, use the slate with the paper. And if they're just scribbling for fun, it doesn't matter. The light paper will be just fine. Um, if they want something that's going to hold up a little longer, then give them something a little thicker. One kind of paper I really like is sketchbook paper. It's, you can buy it in like Target, Walmart, arts and crafts stores. You can buy them in um, like pads that are bigger where you can rip them off from the top or you can buy spiral sketch notebooks. That's what I really liked. Um, I used those a lot when I was younger to do journaling. Um, I used them in college to actually take notes because I didn't have a braille note taker for part of my time in college. Um, so I used that. So it gives you the paper, the sketch paper holds up really well. And um, it, with the spiral, it, you can keep track of it super easily um, because everything is together in a book. Um, it, having a bunch of loose paper was always a real problem for me. Um, you can, of course, take braille paper that's hole punched, or you can hole punch it and put it in a binder too. That's another or a folder. Um, but I had a real problem when I was younger. I would, you know, slate things or braille things on papers, and then I would just sort of leave them all over the place, and it drove my mom crazy. And now it drives me crazy. So I, I like to have things organized um, into folders or binders or something. Um, does anyone have? before I go on to some labeling stuff. Jennifer, I have uh, in the chat box uh, one question and one comment. The comment first is from Miriam Dixon where she says that uh, she does tell her students um, to remember that you read using the left and that you write using the right. Uh, yes, that makes sense. To remember. That's a good, good memory trick. And then a question from Kayla Bennett was, how old were you when you first started using a Slate and Stylus? When I started using it, I was nine. I wish I would have started earlier. I think younger kids can start grasping the concept and can start thinking of it as a fun way to write Braille and a portable way to write Braille. Um, because Braillers are heavy and sometimes they're hard to push down all those keys. Now, of course, stylus is going to be hard to punch through, but if, if you use lighter paper, that kind of goes away. And I just think the more Braille is under kids' hands and in kids' hands and a part of life, I think that's better. And so if, if I had a younger kid that needed to learn Braille, I would, I would introduce a slate earlier. Um, but I used it from when I was nine on. Um, and then when I went to training, I went to training at Blind Incorporated actually, and I used it a lot more there and got a lot faster at it. And that's when I did a lot of note taking actually in college with it because I was fast enough to do that. Um, so I think that's the other thing about learning it young is you become faster and more accurate with it. Um, and there's just so much portability and I'll go more into some of the, the ways I've used it. And I know it's a very low tech tool. You know, there's all kinds of tech out there and, you know, kids are using tech younger and younger, but I think it's always good to have low tech options because your battery can die. I mean, I've been in situations where my, I'm using a Braille, ironically, I'm using a Braille note taker right now for my notes for this presentation. But if the battery was dead, I could have jotted down some notes really quickly without it, or if I would have left it at home, or, you know, there's so many reasons that sometimes you don't want that tech. If it's going to be rainy that day, maybe you don't want to bring your tech. Maybe you need a different option. My slate's always in my purse, and it's amazing how much I still 
pull it out to do quick things. Um, phone messages, uh, uh, information. I used to be really heavily involved in PTA when my kids were younger and I was the PTA secretary. And I would often just take notes with my slate because I didn't want to lug my, and I, for a while I didn't even have a braille note taker. Then I got one, but I didn't always want to bring it. Um, so I used my slate to take notes. We counted, we did popcorn day and we counted money and I had to write totals that I eventually read to someone else. But my totals, I always jotted them down on a note card with my slate. Um, so it's just always good to have those portable low tech options um, because tech is great, but you know, it has its drawbacks. If you forget your charger one day, that tech is a brick. <laughs> it's nothing for you. So one thing I've always really liked the slate for is labeling. Um, I like to use Dymo tape um, and there's different kinds of tape. So the Dymo tape is clear. And I believe the Independence Market sells it. You can get it at other blind places. You can also get a version of this kind of tape at office supply places sometimes because it can go in like those um, labelers that people have that you, you dial and squeeze the trigger and it makes labels. I think you still can get them. I haven't tried for a while. But some of that tape is colored, um, which it doesn't always matter, but if it matters in my house because a lot of the labels I make, people have to be able to see underneath them. <laughs> so we try to stick to the clear at my house, but we did when I was younger where I had some colored, because I had a lot of cassette tapes that I wanted to organize. So I had some colored labels on those because it didn't really matter. Um, the way you use the Dymo tape, now the plastic slates don't have the slots, but most metal slates do. Some of them are on the back like these. There's one long slot here and one here. Um, some are on the front. I think they're still make, that's what the very first one I ever had with slots was like on the front, but either way works. And I'll just show you, so I have the roll of Dymo tape. When you're threading the Dymo tape, make sure the side that peels, that's sticky, is facing upward or yeah, because otherwise you're going to get it written on the peeling side, which won't work. So you want the side that you're going to be wanting the braille to be on downward into the metal slate. Pull it through. Hopefully this works visually. Okay. And then you have it. So you have one line and it's the second line of the slate and you can write on that one line. I use this all the time. <laughs> I label appliances. I label, um, Movies, although now we've been buying, making more of our movies digital, but when we had actual um, Blu-rays and DVDs, I would label the cases. Um, now it's mostly for like appliances or canned goods at home sometimes, um, boxes, um, anything that I need to mark. We've adapted board games using this. Um, my, um, we've also just written directly on game cards with a slate, but we've often done demo tape labels. My youngest son, is the only one that was really interested in learning Braille. And so he knows Braille and can use the slate. And he's helped me adapt a lot of games for myself and even for our training center here. So we often use demo tape for that. Um, what else have I done? All, all my home appliances, often sometimes I have to redo the, oh, spices. I've done a lot of my spices with demo tape. So it's just really handy, really easy to be able to write. And then you can cut your labels with a scissors. You can also use a slate on the clear permabrill bigger sheets that have the sticky on the back. That works great too um, if you happen to have them. But Dymo tape is cheap and it's another thing that's portable. It's another thing that I always sort of have in my purse and I might need to mark something at a hotel. I might need, I used to sometimes mark the shampoo and conditioner. Now I've gotten kind of lazy because of Ira and I just can check that way. But when I was less lazy and more into labeling, <laughs> I would mark things at hotels too. Um, so um, it's just a really handy labeling tool. Um, and um, the one line slate is great too, because then you just have that one line, you never get confused as to where to write. But if you don't have just the one line, when you're writing, you can feel with your stylus that you're actually writing on something. It does not push through. Like when you're writing on paper, you can actually kind of hear it and feel it pushing through. When you're on Dymo tape, you don't get that click but you can feel that there's something solid under there that you're writing on and so you can you can do it um, and you can just do a line at a time or a couple words at a time and they're real easy to cut are there any questions about labeling with the slate okay 
I do have one so, question here, sorry, in the chat oh, yeah. from Donna Jenkins, where she asked, can you show again how you inserted the demo tape? Oh, absolutely. If I can find my, oh, okay, yes. <laughs> I was gonna say, considering if I can find my demo tape, but I did find it, so yes. So I have the two slots and I start from the left, well, the way I'm holding it, I generally have the slot that is closest to the hinge on the left. And then I thread the dymo tape, making sure the side that is going to be peeled is upward. Pull it through and then put it. You want to show it before you close the slide? Yeah, here. So you have, is that? Yeah. Yep. So you have the line and then I close it. And then I pull so that I have as little of the end showing as possible because otherwise that's wasted tape you can't write on that and you have to be careful with that because if you pull too hard you're going to have your end come into it and and it won't stay um, but you also don't want to waste a bunch of tape um, which you know i mean you can get more tape but i'm just kind of funny about that i don't like to have a bunch of wasted stuff so that's how i do it and then you can just use it and and make your labels and then you open it and you can pull it out and then if there was braille on here you would just use a scissors um, I really like, there's these folding scissors that you can get at convention every year from Iowa, and they're great for cutting dialogue tape and having in my, do you have one? Yeah, nice, yeah. Yeah. So Kyle actually has one. Oh yeah. So they're the folding scissors like this, and they're great for cutting the dialogue tape. Any scissors will work, but these are just nice because they're real small. Um, the kid, the kid safe scissors with the rounded ends don't work great. It can be done, but it's tough. <laughs> I did it in a pinch one time. So some of the ways that I've used slates when I was younger, that still might be appropriate today, I don't know, because there's so much tech and kids are different, but when I was in school, it was a big deal to have notebooks, especially for girls, where you, I, probably only for girls, because when I told my son about this, he just thought it was so dumb, but, <laughs> but girls had these notebooks that you wrote gossip in, and you passed them back and forth, and you read each other's notes and stuff like that. So a couple of my friends wanted to learn Braille, and one of the reasons they wanted to do it was that one of my friends, somebody found her notebook, and the boy she liked got to read all about how much she liked him, and it became this big deal. So she said, you know, if I had Braille, nobody would have been able to read that. And so it became this cool thing. So three of my friends learned Braille. Essentially, they learned it visually, and it was pretty quick. Um, they had an alphabet card, and they learned it, and then we got the cheap um, plastic slates and styluses for them. And we did notebooks back and forth. And even in college, they wrote me letters with my slate, with their slates. Um, so it was, a, it was a fun thing to do. We did it through maybe 10th or 11th grade. But I did a lot of journaling with my slate too, um, with um, sketchbooks. I tried one of those little cool diaries with a lock that I thought was really fun. And it had very thin paper. And it worked with my note card size slate. I had one that actually had a hinge instead of the kind that I've seen more now where you actually slide the card in. And I think they still make the ones that actually have the hinge that you open up. So I used that, but the problem with it was that the braille went away too fast, it faded. It was a cool little book, but it, the, everything kind of faded. So now these pocket books could be a great little diary, um, you know, for, for short things. And the braille won't fade because it's on little like note cards. Um, so I think if I was a kid now, I'd probably get one of these and do a little journal. But I did it, I did it more in sketch spirals, and that worked too. Um, what else? Uh, playing cards, a lot. I, I often will forget my Braille cards and I want to play because my family is very into cards. And so I can buy just any deck. The, the ones I like the best are the real sturdy, I think they're bicycle brand, and they're like they, that holds up the best, but if I'm just going to be playing for a weekend or something, even a cheap deck will do, and you can easily use your slate and make um, playing cards. I do it a lot for birthday cards, um, especially for other blind friends. I sign cards that way for other blind friends. They can actually read what I, you know, if I write a little message for someone's wedding, things like that, I'll put that in the card. Um, I've used it for playing the game Clue. Um, like noting what I have for cards and what um, I found, what items I found, categories, any of the games where you kind of write stuff down. Um, I've used my slate. 
um, my family used to do like some scavenger hunts. We'd have to find certain items. Um, we, we played games like that and I would keep track of my items on my slate. Um, I definitely did assignments when I was in middle school. I used to do it as like a calendar, like just a spiral thing of note cards. And I used my slate and had a calendar. Now I do my calendar on my phone, which I would think most people would do now, but it, it's still a good when kids are younger. Grocery lists were a big thing. Often my mom and I would go to the store and she bought me to keep track of the list. And so that was one way I practiced my slate. I would do it on paper. I would do it on a note card, depending how much stuff we needed. And then I would get my writing practice and then I'd get my reading practice when I was at the store with her. Um, what else? There was a question. Oh, is there a question? Oh, about the cell, about the uh, individual cells. Let's see. Uh, will you talk about the little, the little bumps every five cells, but oh, there is a- Yes. Let me go back to the video. So there's like markings on the slate. That's a good point. I did not talk about them. Um, they're a good way to know where you're at. So each rectangle is a cell. And every five, can, there's a little bump um, in between the second and third, or the first and second line, and in between the third and fourth line. There's also a ridge that runs um, across that separates the first, the, yeah, first and second lines from the third and fourth lines. Um, but those little bumps are good markers if you have to stop or, um, oh, I know another thing we used to use. We played Yahtzee a lot when I was a kid, and I would do the scores on my slate because instead of filling in the little score sheet. So when it was my turn with my friends, I would um, do it that way. And then these little markers were great for that because when I was done, um, you know, putting somebody's points in, like say they got two on ones or whatever, then I could count how far I was on the little marks. So um, to keep track of where I was on the line. So I didn't write over something. The worst thing on a slate is that if you get off track where you're writing, you're gonna write over things. And you will feel that with the stylus, but by the time you feel that with the stylus, it's too late. Your profile is not as legible anymore. <laughs> so um, that is, and I don't, I never have, oh yeah, they have them in the plastic slates too. The marks, I believe, let me make sure. I'm a slate snob, I don't really like the plastic, but I do like it for learning. Do you wanna? Uh, yes, the marks are on the plastic slates too. Do you wanna open it and then they can see the grooves clearer? Okay, and then, oh, wait. Yeah, and the marks I'm talking about, those little, these little dots, they're like little bumps. They almost feel like little braille dots that are on there. So they're very handy, very handy for tracking. They do make, um, I've seen them, they're like a whole page slate. Could be very handy for someone that want, does a lot of writing on paper. Um, I had a foreign exchange student from um, the Ukraine and she had a full page slate. I guess it's more common, or at least to her, she thought it was more common in Europe because a lot of people she knew throughout Europe had page slates. And it seems like it was taught at a very young age in Europe. Brailers were much less common. Um, I don't think she'd used a brailler until she came to, and she even went to a school for the blind. So slates are a lot more common. You don't want to show a brailler, right? No. Okay. Um, the thing, oh, another way that people, I've, when, I've taught, when I've taught people with slate and stylus is sometimes what's fun, and you could do this in a lot of different ways, but sometimes we've done conversations back and forth. So like somebody will write a couple of sentences, somebody will read them, and then write a couple and answer. Um, when, I, when my kids were little, we did a lot of continuing stories. We'd say them um, because it was a way... <laughs> Quite honestly, it was a way when we were walking, it was just a way to know where all my kids were, but it was also fun. Um, or when we were waiting at the bus stop, it was just something, again, I knew right where they were because they were talking and reacting to the story, but it was also just a fun thing, but it would be a, another great thing for slate practice if, if people wanted to write a continuing story back and forth. Um, or even if somebody wrote in print and, and you know read their part and then the other person wrote in braille, I mean, that would work too. Anything that makes it fun. Some people, when I've taught them, have copied song lyrics for practice. Um, I've known people that want to get faster that copy as they're hearing an audiobook and see how much they can keep up with. 
um, just a fun way to, to build your speed. Um, so I really think that it's a good tool in your toolbox. So when we talk in the training center, we talk a lot about having tools in your tool belt or tools in your toolbox. And having that slate there is always a thing, um, is, is a really great option. Um, you know, as you get older, you may not use it as much because you start using more high tech stuff, but it's always something to fall back on. It's always that great tool. Um, and it just makes Braille, Braille is such a great literacy thing, but writing is just as important as reading. And it makes that writing easier and fun and just a thing that can be done all the time. Um, you know, guys could put a slate in their pocket, women can put it in their purse or back, but anybody as a young kid can put it in their backpack. You can even keep it in one of those cool little pencil cases or the, the boxes that kids use for supplies. Um, you know, it's, it's just something that can fit in there. It's your pen and pencil, essentially. I, I, that's what I kind of equate it to. We had a hand raised by Joan Miller. Did you have a question? Check in the chat box. Will you talk about the pins versus? Oh, I was going to add that um, you can also use it like for trivia questions as well. Yes, trivia questions is another great idea. Yep. Yep. Trivia questions are another fun way. Keep track of your answers or your points, anything you're keeping track of points with. But yeah, trivia questions would be fun. Was there something else in the chat too? I don't know how we're we looking on time. We had a couple of chat questions. One was, do you have any tips for keeping track of spacing? The best way is with those marks. Um, also just remembering, helping. So I, when I'm writing with my slate, put it back on paper and I can show. So when I'm with my slate, it's a two-handed thing. So, this may not be perfectly straight because I didn't bother to align very well. But when I'm writing, I have, I, I check out where I'm going to go. And then I always have, so my left index finger next to where I'm writing, I move it along. So if I did an A, which I just did, and I want a space, I move my stylus and my left hand. And, and so I'm skipping that cell. And then I do the B, but I always have my other hand there to help keep me on track. And it gets easier and easier. Adjusting the slate gets easier too. I'm just throwing the alphabet. I have not done thick paper for a while. N. And then I can fit in O. And so you come to the end of your line, instead of a ding like the brailler has, you hit that, there's nothing for my left finger to go to. So I know that I then go to the next line. And when I want to adjust it, you use the little pins that are on the left and right. And you move your slate down and you line up that pin with the top of the, the, the little hole that's already been created. I put it on the top pin. And then I push the next pins through and close it up. Um, so that's how you can adjust your site. Now, at first, and even sometimes now, if I'm in a hurry, I go crooked. Um, so if I'm worried that it's going to be crooked, I might adjust it further down um, just to make sure everything gets in. And it depends what I'm doing for a more formal thing that someone else is going to read. I'm a lot more careful. For something quick and dirty that I'm just doing for myself, I still try to be as straight as possible, but I don't worry quite as much. I go for more of the speed. Um, so that's how I do. And, and you know that you have four lines and you can move it down. Well, I think it's what, 26 or 28 lines. So you can move it down six or seven times if you do it correctly. Um, and keep, if I'm, I have a question or I'm not sure, I will often flip it over and check where my top line or where my bottom line is of actual dots and then move it down that way. So sometimes I've done that um, so that I know that I'm not writing over anything. That's what I often do. You can always turn it over and look at what you've done.
Are there other questions? Uh, we had one more question um, regarding, is there a website or some way to get, where parents can get information about teaching their children at home? That is a yes. really good question. I know there's a free site and stylus program through the NFB. And I think, is there information on the NOPBC website about the slate and teaching the slate? Or did you know of um, one, Kyle? You know of I know site? of one that I use to check my Braille, like a, a, an app. I know the Alexa has some Braille skills built into it, but I have not used it a lot. So there's an app called Braille Contractions that, I, that I'll use to like check my work. Oh, that's another idea, Braille Contractions app. And I know there's the Louisiana Center sells a really good book of um, all the Braille contractions. And I believe it has print and Braille in it. I believe it's the Louisiana Center that sells it. I've seen those and those are really good. I know for a while, um, AFB, I believe, American Foundation for the Blind, had a site. It was called like the Braille Bug, and it had all kinds of different activities and fun stuff for parents and for kids to do together. And I don't know if that still exists. I, I mainly work with adults now, so <laughs> I haven't been as in tune with all the kid stuff, but maybe Michelle knows more. There's actually something back here that, but it, that it's like, um, I, I think it's what you're talking about. There's, I mean, there's braille blocks that, you know, you push the, the cells. There's lots of fun braille tools. I know APH has some things, and so does National Braille Press. I know there's a book, Just Enough to Know Better, or something like that, where it helps teach, it helps parents learn braille, that National Braille Press used to sell. That was very good. Hadley still has courses, too, I believe, for um, parents who want to learn braille and it may give ideas for teaching Braille as well. The Hadley School for the Blind, which is mail order or mail lessons, lessons by mail. And I think some online now too. Do you have any other questions? What, what time is it? 11.39. Oh, good, we're close to time, okay, that pretty well. Any other questions before we conclude? Uh, there's one other question regarding uh, tips on timing your speed. Do you have any oh. tips on that? Yeah, so um, that's a really good one. I know when I was learning and my teacher was timing me, she would have me, she would dictate something to me that I would write and then, um, I think sometimes she had the words pre-counted, but sometimes, well, actually, no, she'd have me count my words because I had to count, I could only count accurate words. And, and we do like a five minute timing, and then we divide um, the number of words I got correct by the time. So um, that's one thing. Um, I wouldn't, I guess I do, I mean, it was fun, but sometimes it was discouraging, especially when I was really slow, to see how slow I really was. So I guess I wouldn't, I, I think I did better for me personally, like trying, I did try to keep up with like audiobooks or I tried to keep up when people were talking to me, um, keep up with a song and writing lyrics. So it wasn't as much timed. That was more fun for me. I liked, I, I still got faster, but the timing kind of freaked me out sometimes and got me up, got me nervous. So I guess it really depends on your kid or your student or, and, and I know, especially IEP goals, you do have to time people. <laughs> so then, then of course, that's a whole different thing. But I think at first, just making it fun and making it, you know, helping them get faster without as much timing if you can might be better because it can be, I, I don't like, you don't always like to know how, how poorly you're doing. But it is also fun, I guess, at times to know how much you're improving. So like a beginning of the year and end of the year test, for instance, or beginning of the semester, end of the semester, could be really cool because then you get that that comparison like hey look how far I've come um, so um, but just practicing getting faster listening to audiobooks listening to people um, that's for reading too I used to I used to like to follow along with the same book in Braille and that's how I got and then going to church and following along at church got me faster so that's how I developed my reading speed too so just trying to keep up with others 
And if you have another person that's good at the slate and you try to do the same thing at the same time, that's good motivation too. Or even if you and your child are doing slating, you know, kind of having a slate race, it can be fun. Or if you're a teacher, you and your student having kind of a slate race can be a fun thing. Great. Well, it looks like, unfortunately, Michelle lost her audio, so I'm going to oh. close this out. Um, All right. I did want to thank everyone for coming, and of course, thank you, Jennifer, for your time. It was incredibly informative. Um, it's almost 1245 anyway, so we're pretty much right on schedule. Uh, and if anyone has any additional questions, just please go to the NOPBC.org website, and I'm sure that there'll be a comment portion for you to receive not only this recording, but also additional questions. Um, also, if people want to connect with me, I am on the um, Crowd Compass attendee app um, under Jennifer Wenzel. So I'm, I'm more than happy to connect with anybody that way too. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thank you. You take care. You too, Nick. Have a good day, everyone.